Okay, good afternoon, everybody. There's about 50 odd people online and people still joining, but we'll make a start. So welcome to the first of, this is the first, isn't it? Of the 2022 um, LID seminars. Uh, many of you will have joined us over the last couple of years and welcome if you haven't joined us before. Um, we will follow the same format we've been following in previous years. So we will have one speaker first who will speak for about half an hour and then there'll be an opportunity for some discussion. Uh, if you want to ask questions, we'll moderate the questions. You need to put them in the Q&A. Don't put them in the chat because we can't watch two things at the same time. So just put them in the Q&A um, and then we'll have a very quick stretch break and then we'll have the second speaker um, starting at, at four o'clock. Um, you, you can't speak, so you won't interrupt us. Uh, <laughs> you can do whatever you like while you're watching. Um, so I'm Chris Bigby, the Director of the Living with Disability Research Centre, and it's a great pleasure today to introduce Associate Professor Ruth Walker, who's from Flinders University in Adelaide. Ruth is um, a social gerontologist, so it's, it's great that she's somebody from sort of outside and not as entrenched in, in the disability sector um, as some of us are. And often people from outside bring sort of fresh eyes and fresh perspectives. So she's been researching uh, aging parent or caregivers of people with intellectual disabilities um, and looking at future planning over the last few years. And in particular, has looked at people from non-English speaking backgrounds people from Greek and Italian um, families. So she's going to talk about some of that research that she's done over the last few years, and no doubt will then give you a bit of a preview of the current ARC linkage project that she's working on um, that some of us from the center are also part of. So over to you, Ruth, and welcome. You've got about half an hour, um, Go, and I'll just tell you to stop if you just keep going. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Chris. Right. Welcome. Um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chris, for your welcome and for your introduction and inviting me to, um, to speak with all of you today. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm an associate professor at Flinders University in Adelaide, and I'm going to be talking to you today about um, some of the research I've been doing over the past few years, uh, as Chris said, around future planning. Um, for older parents um, who uh, have sons and daughters with intellectual disability. I would like to begin, uh, to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, for me at Flinders University, uh, where I'm coming talking to you from today, uh, we are on Ghana land and I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. So yeah, just to give a little bit of background to um, the work I've been doing over the past few years, um, as probably many of you who are listening today would be aware, um, it, it, people with intellectual disability are living longer, um, which is a fantastic um, you know, achievement and reflects both medical advances and um, and social care. Um, it also presents them uh, the issue, I guess, that um, people with intellectual disability uh, are increasingly living with um, their parents or being cared for by their parents who are also aging. And we know um, studies have consistently shown over many years um, that despite knowing that um, so despite parents knowing that they need to plan for the future of their family member with intellectual disability, um, older parents often report feeling very unprepared and unsure about what the future holds. Um, so whilst uh, this, this sort of dynamic is seeing an extended caregiving role for parents, uh, equally we know that adults with intellectual disability have a right to choose uh, where and how they live and what their future looks like as well. Um, and this is certainly um, at risk if, if there aren't plans in place or if, if things are really left until a crisis occurs. 
So um, it's been around seven years now since I first started looking at this um, issue. And, and as Chris said, I came to this um, field as a social gerontologist um, with a real interest in um, transitions in the lives of older people, particularly transitions around caregiving, um, changes in terms of families and things like that. Um, and so that's how I first came into this field. And I'm just going to go through today, as Chris said, um, some of these projects which have really ultimately led to the ARC linkage project that um, uh, Chris um, is, a, is a, an investigator, chief investigator on with myself uh, and Elan Wiesel from um, the University of Melbourne. And I'll, I'll introduce the broader team um, further on. Okay, so when I first started looking at this issue back in around 2015, um, I came at it, as, as I think I've mentioned, um, really because I, it occurred to me when I started to look at the literature that um, although this wasn't a surprise to many people working in this field, um, there was this notion that, you know, older parents, we've known about this, that as, what's going to happen as parents age uh, and are no longer able to care for their um, a family member with intellectual disability in the family home. Um, so not only had this been recognised for decades, but what had happened is that um, we'd also known that, you know, there was needs for parents to put plans in place, but um, nothing was really happening. There was no, um, there hadn't been any sort of initiatives that had really, we could say, had taken off in terms of being able to support parents to plan for the future. Most of the literature that I looked at um, was focusing on this issue from the perspective of families whereby the person with intellectual disability was living still in the family home. Um, so not so much literature had looked at uh, what, what were the future plans of, of parents and carers whose son or daughter had already moved out of home and who were living in the community. So what we did was we wanted to sort of have a look at um, how parents experience this role in terms of how they juggle their own ageing um, and frailty with this extended caregiving role, um, but also what were parents doing in terms of supporting their parent, uh, sorry, their um, sons and daughters? And was it different for those who were still living in the family home um, versus those whose uh, son or daughter had moved out of home? So we spoke to um, around 17 or 17 older um, parent caregivers um, and they, they were all in South Australia recruited through disability service providers. Um, most of the um, family members with intellectual disability were actually living out in the community. So six were still living in the family home, um, but the remainder were, were living out of home. I'll just, I'm not going to go over this in too much detail because we've got a lot to get through, but I just wanted to highlight um, three key themes. Um, these were that across all participants, regardless of whether, whether the uh, family member with intellectual disability was living at home or the community, um, these three themes really arose and were, were quite um, consistent. The first was, and it probably won't come as any surprise, um, that all parents were highly involved in supporting their son or daughter in wide ranging ways. Um, this, this was regardless of whether or not um, the family member with uh, intellectual disability was living at home or in the community. Parents were still um, you know, um, doing things like shopping and managing the food um, situation or bringing food into maybe the supported disability service. They were advocating for their son or daughter. They were supporting continued ties with friends and family, maintaining finances, et cetera. Um, and the second main theme uh, was that we wanted to also find out um, how did parents perceive this role? Um, they did talk about some of the obvious costs associated with this extended caregiving role, but they also um, discussed some real positives or rewarding aspects of the role, such as reciprocal care um, and real pride and, and purpose in terms of um, the, the parenting role that they had. Um, and the last theme uh, was that uh, parents were not making plans for the future. Most didn't have a plan in place. There was very vague understandings between family members um, in terms of whether or not a plan existed or not, what, what the future um, plan was for um, their family member with intellectual disability. Um, and so 
after uh, after conducting that study, we we'd also picked up in the literature that there was a real lack of um, research in this area from the perspective of culturally and linguistically diverse families. So um, I was able to get a little bit of funding. It was a fairly small scale study, but we um, we did this project uh, involving families from Greek and Italian migrant backgrounds, just to really find out whether, whether they're planning for the future and what these sorts of plans, if they are in place, uh, what they look like and whether they're, they're different to Anglo, the Anglo sort of sample participants that we spoke to, um, or whether there were similarities. So the two um, migrant groups that we chose to speak to were people from Greek and Italian backgrounds. Um, there's a range of reasons for that. One is that at the time of doing the research, of course, and you'd be aware, um, they, they are two, or were still are um, two of the largest cohorts of older, older post-war migrants. Um, and we also, or myself personally, have um, contacts with some research assistants who have Greek and Italian background. So that, that helped as well. Uh, so we recruited by a range of different places, including disability service providers and culturally specific, culturally specific community groups, personal contacts and networks of our research team, who, as I mentioned, involved Greek and Italian research assistants. Um, that was a real strength in that uh, our research assistants were able to conduct interviews in preferred language of participants be that um, modern Greek or Italian. And we ended up speaking with 19 carers um, who came from uh, four Greek families and around 10, eight, 10 Italian families. These interviews, um, whilst we set out to interview older parents, uh, inevitably involved um, siblings. In one case, we had a grandmother as well take part in the sort of family interview. Um, and this was, uh, we were guided by what, what people really felt comfortable doing in terms of who they wanted to be involved in these interviews. So just to briefly go over the main themes from this body of work, um, the main themes were around um, it's our responsibilities. So both sets of uh, families we spoke to, both Greek and Italian families, strongly felt that uh, looking after their family member was their family responsibility, not really the responsibility of the state or the government or service providers. Um, yet they were quick to point out as well that they would like some support from governments and guidance around what happens as they get old, as they get older and, and um, they're aware of the future and what, what's going to happen there. Um, similar to the previous study, again, there was real uncertainty around future plans. Parents became quite upset thinking about the future. They said and reported that they thought about the future all the time but uh, they were avoiding really, um, and especially the siblings suppose, um, spoke about this, that uh, their family members, their, their parents were really avoiding making firm plans. An interesting finding as well was that um, this re relates to the theme that I've, I've called paradox of filial responsibility. Um, this idea that what we picked up in this research is the idea that there may be a bit of a disjunction between first and second, third generation migrants, and that the siblings, um, although they are aware that their parents expect them to look after their sibling with intellectual disability, um, there was some sort of friction and some um, evidence to suggest that siblings were actually challenging their parents' um, preference for them to look after their, their sibling. Um, and challenging the parents' resistance for their sibling to leave the family home and perhaps go into a, 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 um, a supported accommodation sort of setting. So after carrying out those two, two um, projects, we, we sort of thought, well, what, you know, we're, we're finding, you know, recurring themes here. This, is, this stuff has been talked about in the literature as well for decades. So where do we go from here? What do we do for these parents were telling us that they aren't planning, they don't know how to plan. It's all very overwhelming. 
Um, we got a small amount of funding, again, from um, which we gratefully received from Office for Ageing Well in South Australia to do a bit of a sort of pilot study um, to find out, go and actually talk to parents and find out how we can support them to put plans in place. Um, we were very aware um, that there's been a range of interventions um, in Ireland, the US, et cetera, that have been developed to support, you know, bring parents together to support them to, in some cases, actually make plans, sit in a workshop and make up a plan, talk to financial planners, talk to lawyers, think about all this stuff. But this, we're still, you know, there was the feeling that there, there's, there was no real... Um, supports or resources that we in Australia, for example, would just take on board and say, yes, this works. This is what we can do for older parents. So we went, as I said, it was, we wanted to go and speak to parents about what they, what they need, what would help them. Uh, we conducted three focus groups, which involved 28 people, um, recruited from a range of different places. Um, and the key questions were really things like, uh, what does the ideal future look like for your family member? What would it take for this ideal future to happen? Um, have you made plans for the future? If, if you have, what helped to get you to that point? If you haven't, you know, what, what, what could help you to make some, a concrete plan if that exists? Um, so what we found were four major things or themes, but one of which um, I hope you can see that there's an arrow pointing there, I can't see on my screen, but um, pointing to the, the issue around accommodation. Uh, and that's the one that we've really um, honed in on for the ARC linkage. But before I, I mention that, I will just uh, briefly go over these four themes. Um, so parents talked about accommodation as the, the really pressing um, issue. They talked also about you know, the quality or the fear fears around, um, you know, who else is going to care for my son or daughter as well as I do, or who knows them as well as I do. I do um, mistrust of services, all of that, just feeling quite overwhelmed, um, feeling like they just don't have access to appropriate information and they would like a one-stop shop somewhere they can go for, for um, that is specifically tailored for them as older parents, older carers of adults with intellectual disability. And they also really wanted um, us to take away from the focus groups that they feel that they as carers, um, a, a specific group of carers, I guess, um, their needs aren't really recognised or um, they're not supported um, very well, uh, unlike some other kind of carer groups. So as I mentioned, accommodation or housing arrangements was a huge theme. Um, the, the people we talked to, spoke to, um, the first thing they talked about when we said, you know, have you put plans in place? What, what support would you like? They say, well, you know, where they live, that's the big one. That's the elephant in the room. Um, there's all these sorts of um, issues around finding appropriate accommodation for your child. You know, when's the right time to look? Where do we look? All of this sort of thing. Um, uh, even though we would have loved them to have, to have told us, you know, have given us one single solution to assist them. Of course, there, what came out of these focus groups was there's no single solution to assist parents with planning for the future. Um, but there's a range of areas in which carers need support, specifically just to give them the ability or headspace to plan, to think about the future. Um, these included, as I've already mentioned, accommodation was the big one, um, having clarity about what's available and how, how you find it. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, someone um, basically, you know, they almost spoke about wanting a replica of themselves to be able to take that person-centered um, holistic care of their family member. Um, and I've mentioned as well information and their own needs being recognized. Okay, so um, what, what this has all culminated in, which has been a fantastic achievement, um, and I'm really, really pleased to be able to, to take this, um, all these study findings forward. Uh, in, we were funded by the Australian Research Council linkage scheme. Uh, this was announced last year in 2021. Um, to take all of this evidence and really try to actually um, do something 
for for family members, uh, sorry, families and uh, individuals with intellectual disability. We decided to hone in on one specific area, as I mentioned, so we're really interested in this project in uh, looking at post-parental housing transitions. So what happens when individuals with intellectual disability uh, move out of the family home? As I mentioned before, um, the research team, we come from um, Flinders University, La Trobe University, so um, fantastic to have um, Professor Christine Bigby from um, your this research centre as a chief investigator. Uh, we also have Ilan Wiesel from the University of Melbourne, who brings some um, sort of housing um, as, um, as well as all sorts of other um, expertise to this project. Uh, Philippa Angley from National Disability Services and uh, Fiona and Claire from Flinders and Irene, who's the research manager, and uh, Tim Adam, who's a co-researcher on the project. Um, importantly, our industry partners are Office for Aging Well, um, National Disability Services, as well as two um, disability service providers, uh, Bedford from South Australia and GenU from Victoria. The aims of this project are really to um, address this issue that I've been talking about today um, around um, people with intellectual disabilities um, uh, tending, you know, outliving their family carers and what can we do to better support individuals with intellectual disability to, to live um, how and where they, they want to. Um, but importantly, what we want to do from this research is generate a national evidence-based framework for ensuring successful post-parental um, housing transitions. So the project uh, has three stages. We're currently um, undertaking stages one and two at the same time at the moment. Uh, so stage one is really interested in finding out what are the key determinants of um, a successful transition for um, an individual with intellectual disability from the family home to alternative housing arrangements. Um, the, uh, at the same time, what we're also doing is looking at um, people or families and uh, people with intellectual disability who are still living in the family home, but have started thinking about um, moving out or moving to alternative housing arrangements. Um, and we want to find out what their preferences are in terms of where they live, what sorts of housing models suit them, um, what, what factors out in the environment are important. You know, is it being close to, um, staying close to where they have always lived, being in their familiar environment, you know, what, what is it that's important? And then the culmination of the project, the final stage, is that we want to create um, resources. We don't know what that's going to look like yet because it will be informed by the, the um, earlier stages of the project. Um, and these will be um, co-designed um, and co-designed aspects are built into this project all the way along um, so that we can build these resources uh, or produce these resources hand in hand with individuals with intellectual disability and their, their family carers. Um, just briefly, so what we're doing, uh, what it actually looks like, uh, our interviews in stage one, we're hoping to, we've started in Adelaide, but we're hoping to also conduct some interviews in Sydney and Melbourne with adults with intellectual disability who've moved out of the family home in roughly the last two years, um, as well as their parents or carers. Um, and we're also doing a set of interviews with disability service providers who've also experienced um, or worked with supported uh, families through this transition uh, to get their experiences of what's worked well or what hasn't. The second stage, which I mentioned we are doing at the same time as stage one and we've started again in Adelaide, um, is uh, hoping to speak with adults with intellectual disability living at home, but as I said, thinking of moving out and again interviews in the three different cities. And this will also involve a, a follow-up survey, uh, a larger survey to explore this issue further. And then stage three, like I said, the workshops uh, will be carried out where we co-design and build um, these sets of resources for families. Um, and 
you know, we expect that this will be a back and forth process of designing and checking and um, yeah, workshopping and making sure that what we come out with um, is fit for, fit for purpose for all stakeholders. So that's um, our ARC linkage project, which we're very excited about. Um, if any of you want to help with recruiting participants or want to take part in the study yourselves, please do get in touch. Um, I'll give you my details in a minute. But um, exciting to also uh, say that we have a PhD scholarship opportunity. So if anybody listening is interested in doing a PhD or knows someone who is, um, we would love to hear from you. We have a three year fully funded PhD scholarship um, to work with us on the ARC linkage project. And um, you can look at, you know, depending on the person and their, um, you know, where you come from, your discipline, your interests, uh, we, we'd love to talk to you and um, explore uh, what that might look like. So my details are at the bottom of the slide there um, and you can get in touch with, with any of us. Um, if, if you're listening today and you're involved with Christine's research centre, obviously you can also speak with Christine. So that's it from me. Hopefully I stuck to time. Right, we might start again. Um, I want to welcome uh, Jenna McNabb, uh, who's going to do the second talk this afternoon. Jenna's a, a, a PhD student um, in the Living with Disability Research Centre. She's also uh, a lawyer and uh, has uh, worked in the New South Wales Public Servant Service in various capacities uh, for a long period of time. Um, so she's got a very strong background in understanding the sort of formal policy around capacity uh, and, and decision making. But her, her thesis is looking at how do substitute decision makers make decisions and does it line up with uh, issues around supported decision making. So she's going to present part of the findings of her thesis. It's incredibly rich and detailed. Um, so she's not going to be able to present a whole thesis. You'll have to wait for that for the next presentation. Um, so over to you, uh, Jenna. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Chris. Um, I just want to reiterate Ruth's acknowledgement of the country and say that I'm in Wollongong on Darrell land and that I pay respects to elders past, present and future. Um, I'll just skip to the second slide because you already kind of did the introduction of topic for me, Chris. Um, and I just want to say that uh, in designing this topic, the literature review illuminated a huge gap in um, knowledge around the way that public guardians around the world um, their decision making on a practical level. So um, this thesis aims to understand how those substitute decisions are made. And when I say how, I mean in the practical sense, on the ground, day to day decision making, um, and not in accordance with, or whether they are or not in accordance with policy and procedures. Um, one, I wanted to look at whether the practices were inclusive of people with disabilities. And thirdly, to have a look at whether the decision-making processes of guardians actually align with the human rights approach of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, um, of which Australia is a party. Um, in doing the research, I have to acknowledge um, my personal perspective, I guess, because the research is um, framed by me in a way. Um, so I just wanted, Chris already did some background, but you know, I've been doing disability law and policy in government for over 20 years. Um, and in some ways I've moved to identifying more with the disability community than bureaucracy, I guess. And that's because I have lived experience um, and so my world is framed by that as well as being a government employee. So I do have a psychosocial disability and this um, has meant that over my life, I have had decision-making issues and cognition issues. So I have had people make decisions for me informally. I've had people assist me to make decisions and kind of coerce me into making decisions. So I feel that that is something um, that is, fairly primary to understand when I'm doing this research. Um, 
I know that that is not, doesn't mean that I can speak for or understand how other people with disability feel. So I just want to acknowledge that, that's personal perspective. I also um, have been a director and co-founder of an organisation called Capacity Australia, which was an advocacy, or is an advocacy organisation designed to educate um, the community and also professionals about capacity, so decision-making capacity and decision-making ability. I also want to say that this quality of research is really new to me because I do have a legal background and I haven't ever done quality of research before because um, in the legal world, we look more at, um, at, at legal discourse, I guess, and not at building theories from the ground up. So design-wise, design um, my study has looked at participants who are public guardians in the New South Wales system, and that's who the data was collected from. I recruited them via um, an email to the Office of Public Guardian, which was generic, so asking for an expression of interest, not particularly um, targeting specific public guardians. Um, it, so this was purposive sampling, um, and I did this um, sampling until... I had theoretical saturation, which means that I um, conducted interviews with guardians until I felt like I had the data that I needed and no new data was coming through that was relevant to my aims. Um, the interviews, I did seven of them and they were one-on-one, -on -one, um, semi-structured. So there was a question sheet, which I followed um, loosely and they were fairly intensive interviews, which lasted from about 50 minutes to two hours. Um, I think it's important to note that they were done in the offices of the public guardian so that it was in the natural setting of the participants. Um, the method of my study is grounded theory. Um, so this is a quality of research method and um, data is now analyzed line by line and codes are applied to the concepts coming out of those that initial um, line by line coding. These codes are then applied to concepts that are emerging from the data and they become categories. Through constant comparison, a theory can be developed um, and themes can be developed. Also memo writing here is really important with grounded theory because it helps you to sort out concepts and interlink um, themes and generally just order your data. The results of this analysis um, produced six broad themes. So the top two, navigating the authorising environment and using a helicopter lens are the ones that I'll be speaking about today, um, primarily using a helicopter lens. So hopefully I can get through the other one quite quickly. Um, I just want to note that the three at the bottom, so the paying attention to communication and empowerment being fundamental and reflexing, reflexively donning other hats, which by which I mean guardians don't really notice that they're doing this, but they go from being a guardian to being an advocate to being, you know, a negotiator and kind of back again um, really quickly within the decision-making process. But the three things at the bottom rely, um, sorry, relate to all of the three at the top and they kind of permeate through those themes and are interlinked with one another. So my first um, theme, which came from the data, was around navigating the authorising environment. So the authorising environment, I mean, the legislative world, um, which guardians work in, so the New South Wales um, Guardianship Act of 1987, also the policy that emerges from that. Um, so to, to navigate this environment, Guardians use something called both and thinking, which I find really interesting. So this is opposed to either or thinking. So they use this to navigate the tension of acknowledging the conservative nature of the legal substitute decision-making framework that they work in, while they simultaneously manipulate the act to create opportunities or the boundaries of the act to create opportunities to move more towards human rights approach, um, which is in accordance with the UN CRPD. So the basis of both and thinking is that multiple realities can be present at once and they can all be true at the same time. And this reflects the kind of full complexity of life and the complexity of the decision-making process for guardians. So rather than viewing things um, as singular and linear or an option A and an option B, which is an either or, they look at 
option A and option D, and they also work through any options between them or options outside of them. And they do this really creatively to um, make sure that there are alternatives within this environment, which move towards empowerment of people with disability who are under guardianship orders. The sub themes of navigating the authorising environment are that um, guardians reimagine the legal context so that it's correlated with um, a more empowerment human, right, human rights approach of the UNCRPD. Um, they also embrace stigma of risks, but this is within the conservative protectionist environment and they try to manipulate the boundaries of this within the legislation. I thought it was really interesting too that they pay attention, really careful attention to the language that they use. And they, um, they do this in their conversations with um, the person themselves, in the conversations with networks and professionals. And they do it to educate um, those people, but they also do it to ensure that their role and responsibilities are communicated. Um, so let's just move on to the first of those sub themes. And I just want to quickly run through this. Um, you can read read it in your own time. But I think guardians have particular characteristics that help them do this. And, and a lot of them are from social welfare backgrounds. They have a holistic type of practice, um, which is human rights and people focused. Their values are really um, they have courage, integrity, empathy. They believe in autonomy and they also believe in dignity of risk, but with safeguards. They also use the skills of resilience and flexibility. Um, they have great communication skills, they're kind of investigators, they analyze things, and they also have a negotiation role between um, networks and the person. Um, this allows guardians to explore and um, remain flexible and strategic within the current um, legislative and organizational and policy environment. Um, so in doing this, they do embrace the dignity of risk, as I, as I suggested before. Um, and they also pay attention to words um, and promote autonomy in, in everything that they say and do. M moving on to kind of the main theme, the one that's most interesting to me is that the uh, guardians use something called a helicopter lens, and that's a direct quote from one of our participants in the study. Um, they do a person-centered um, pro process of decision-making and it's business as usual to them. So it's very embedded into their routines and into their um, thinking. And one of the quotes that's on the slide is, um, where's the client's voice? If I can't see it, if I can't hear it, where is it? And I think that's really poignant um, to this particular theme. The, the focal point um, starts at the helicopter lens, so an aerial view. And then they delve into populating a map with the person's details. After that, they kind of come back up again when they've got all of the information and they think about um, particular things, which, which I will move on to in the slides um, before they then move back down into the map and they make the decision, they kind of arrive at an exact location. So the sub themes of this, um, using a helicopter lens is that, that they develop an atlas, um, map the person's life, perfect, the person's life, they populate the map with the detail, they then rise above the detail, and then they come back and consider this in context. So that's in line with the process that I was just talking to you about. Um, within, when they develop the high level atlas, they, they're really creating like a legend. So the structure of their legend um, that emerged from the data was that they look at, um, they, they find information, generate information and investigate around the guardian's functions, um, around their legislative policy environment, around the decision itself, the person, the facts, their networks, issues, options, risks and service systems. So there is a hell of a lot going on in that decision-making process in the first stage for guardians, but it's almost reflective. Um, and they keep these in their heads as they go along decision-making um, and populate these as they go. So how they actually do that is kind of propelling down into the person's life. And they do it, some guardians do it 
analytically. So it's like a documented process and they follow that process. But a lot of them do it subconsciously. So they're kind of mind mapping as they go along. And they're asking the question, what do I need to know? And again, that comes from one of the participants. Um, they do this by contextualizing the person's perspective. So this allows them to kind of locate themselves within the environment of the person. And they do this to try and stand in the person's shoes. And interestingly, it's, they, they try to plot kind of the observed position on the map um, so that then they can rise above it and look again at all of those legend detail to move on to the next phase. So developing the individualized map means that they need to populate this legend. So the first one that they, do, they look at is um, the order itself. What's the functions? How do they relate to the decision? Do they have the right function? Do they need another function? Do they have a multiple, multiple functions, which means that they can address um, issues in tandem? So they look at the scope of the order and they assess those things. The second thing that they do when they're populating the map is they define the decisions and that. So they look at, once they've, they've seen the decision and they understand the scope, they then break it down and they look at the decision purpose. They identify whether a decision is significant and insignificant. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, more later. And again, they kind of do, they can do this consciously or subconsciously. It depends on the, the preferred guardian style, but they always, document it. So it's still key when they come to the end of the process, they will have documentation and their reasons will be transparent. Um, and they go through a particular decision process. But they do all of this kind of again on the ground, um, kind of fluidly and and iteratively, I guess. Um, importantly, they can also recognize when decisions are interlinked. So when they need um, further orders or um, whether decisions need to be made consecutively. So I mentioned um, identifying whether the decision was significant or insignificant. I think it's really integral to how the um, guardians assess risk when they're going through the decision making process. They tend to acknowledge that, um, so the data showed that they acknowledge that significant decisions require um, navigation of complexities and these are often decisions that have, um, you know, that are intersectional, that involve substantial conflict um, or are hard to implement. And also the policy definition of, one of the participants suggested the policy definition of significant decision always match with what guardians see as being useful. Um, the kind of decision counts here. So this is what the data showed um, that guardians feel. So if it's an accommodation or access decision, often guardians see that as significant. Whereas um, health decisions without objection, for example, and information provision, so deciding whether to provide or um, collect information from other services um, is seen as a smaller decision. And also um, service decisions. So sometimes what support the person needs is also seen as a small decision. And they are, see, small decisions are fairly routine their usual practice and they're fairly administrative. Um, they're also integral though for the seamlessness of service and the quality of service and the way that a decision can be made in a fluid and iterative manner. Um, small decisions are usually prescriptive and they're taken when there's sometimes when there's no real choice. Um, and that can be due to several limiting circumstances. So this includes money or gaps in service, for example. The nature of the decision at times is actually defined in accordance to the person's view. So the guardian will look at the circumstances around the person and the outcomes for the person and, and ask the person themselves around the significance of the decision before they then categorize it. Um, small decisions often don't have um, a lot of consultation by the guardian and um, guardians see this as being because the services are kind of the buffer. So the support is the buffer between them and the person for small decisions and that they don't want to actually be too intrusive and go back and talk about um, decisions you know, all the time with, with people. 
So again, um, when they're populating a map with detail, they also want to know the person. So knowing the person becomes the compass really, which directs the decision journey as they go along. Um, they try in knowing the person really what guardians seem to be doing is standing in their shoes and trying, trying to use a substitute, sorry, a, um, yeah, substitute judgment, sorry, perspective rather than a substitute decision perspective. So they're trying to work out what the person themselves would do. Um, sometimes when risk is involved in a decision and it's a significant decision, this doesn't always pan out for them. And um, so the legislative principle of, of having wealth, the, the person's welfare and interests are paramount might then come to the fore. But we can talk about that a bit later. So really, um, they use the continuity of their relationship with the person to amplify the person's voice. And they also disentangle kind of well-worn pathways and highlight separate opinions and, and decision routes. And they do this by plotting the, the person's voice on the map. So they meet the person where they are really. And um, that's emotionally, physically, kind of situationally, circumstantially, relation um, and with respect to resources. And they try to understand the person's wishes by building a picture. So they look back and then to look forward and they use long, a long view approach sometimes. They look at patterns of behavior, they see lived experience and they ask about and extrapolate wishes. They also try to understand what the qualitative component of the person's good life is for them. And they educate people about their role and their decision and their net, sorry, about the guardian's role, the decision, their networks. So the, this is the person and the family dynamics around them. They prioritize face-to-face -face engagement, although that is difficult within the resource limitations sometimes. And they try to take the, um, take the time to understand the person's reasons for wanting a particular outcome for a decision. And they test the person's truth, I guess, by checking in with them and the networks around them. So they're kind of doing reality checks as they go along. Um, so they might be questioning kind of long held beliefs or assumptions about the person and noticing changes. And they also reject labels. So again, in populating the legend and um, putting information into the map, they do a fact finding mission. They do investigative work. Um, in relation to this and gather information and opinions from the person and from their networks. Um, it involves, this involves, making, this involves making the right connections with people and focusing on what um, they need from the data, I guess, so what is the right information that they need. And they then connect and analyze facts. And as I said, they check and recheck the truth. So really they're making judgments here about the reliability and applicability of information and they're finding gaps. Um, then once they've worked all this up in the background, they can step back and look again at a more helicopter view. So this is when they rise above the detail. And this is the data found out that like after surveying kind of the topography in detail, they rise above the coordinates and they look at it again um, with a helicopter lens. So they've sifted through and um, found the data that they need. And now they're trying to sort it and get some objectivity from the data. Um, it, this is where there's kind of layers of interconnecting complexity and they need to find the relationships between the detail that they populated in the legend. In this particular um, phase, they're also populating the legend, but they're doing it at a higher level. So they're looking for, um, you know, what are the, the viewpoints that they need to be listening to where are the conflicts? What are the obstacles um, around the options that they're thinking through the decision? What are the critical issues? Are there any impasses that they need to, or barriers that they need to get through? Um, what are the incidental issues and how do they all connect together? And so they do this by, um, again, kind of rising above and, and trying to form a bit of an interrelated grid um, that's more objective than the one that they did when they were trying to find um, or map kind of the other legend items. Um, sorry. 
the other um, item, I guess, that they, they map here is by plotting all the options. So they look looking at possibilities, they're looking at opportunities, and they do that really creatively. They also are looking to solutions um, so that um, where a decision, oh, sorry, where an opportunity or an option seems like it might be out of reach, they look at different solutions around how they can, can get to that option. Um, so I guess that's the route the, that they take. And um, then looking at the outcomes of different decisions and also the consequences of them for the person. They also, in this um, rising above and, and taking a more helicopter lens, they, they then consider risk and they consider it in the context of the map that they've just um, populated. I like the quote that one of the participants gave me, which was, we're not in a nanny state and we really shouldn't, and we shouldn't be. So I think that really reflects um, the, the data that came out of this study and what guardians uh, are thinking when they put this is into effect. So they guardians routinely balance, I guess, um, risk against person's wishes and um, they look at the potential risk of harm for them and for others. And in doing this, they consider the things in the pie chart. So they consider that smaller and less complicated decisions with non-consequential outcomes are assessed as less risky, whereas the significant complex decisions, which have considerable consequences, are of course assessed as greater risk. So um, significant decisions generally have the element of um, risk in them. Where decisions are kind of multiple and the, or the risk magnifies, the person-centered approach moves more, um, sorry, the focus moves more from like a person-centered approach to one of um, trying to keep the person at the at person's wishes in in their mind while moving towards safeguarding that person. So I guess it moves more from will and preference into best interest decision making, and that's despite um, the person's wishes in some circumstances. But they do use the presumption of capacity to enable small decisions where they can, and they do this. Um, as suggested by one participant, sorry, it's a, it, that guardianship in and of itself is actually a safeguard. And, and this is one of the areas where that comes out. So still considering risk in context, some of the other practices that guardians use is to turn the situation on its head and to ask about risk enablement rather than um, you know, mitigating risk in, and to ensure that there's dignity of risk in the process. And they normalize risk in a practical sense. They also personalize risk. So they examine it from the individual subjective risk tolerance um, focus, and they look at specific circumstances. Um, guardians always test the options. So they test them against the information that they have, including the legislative environment that they're in, and they challenge the assumptions put out by service providers and professionals and just generally um, in the legislation itself, which is conservative. To do that, this, they use a step up approach. And by that, I mean, um, they, throughout their decision-making process, they're looking at the options and they're using trials and safeguards, least restrictive safeguards in the first instance. And then they're evaluating these and monitoring these. And they're very flexible in moving from trials sometimes to other options or back again. In doing this, they accept that there may never be a correct answer and that some of the options need to be um, good enough in a sense. Um, again, in considering risk in context, they need to work within the conservative legal framework and they think of things like, so coming out of the data were considerations of um, legal accountability and as a barrier to risk empowerment um, and battling the risk intensity and multiplicity of risk um, while trying to put in least restrictive um, safeguards and looking at guardianship as a last resort. They look at the welfare and interests of a person as directing harm minimization, but as I said before, sometimes they move towards best interest. And they're balancing the immediate effect of risk with future consequences as well. And sometimes they come out of this by steering a middle course 
um, or looking for plan Bs, which might be trials, as I suggested before. Again, considering risk in context um, in, within the legal framework, they're recognizing that risk aversion um, constrains choice and that sometimes safeguarding has to happen because of the insightlessness of a person. I don't know that that's an actual word, but, <laughs> but I've used it anyway. Um, so they sometimes conflate, conflate like lack of insight of the person's, to the person's risk or higher risk. And they then will act by kind of being the person's insight. And they do that from standing in the shoes of the person themselves after they've gathered detailed information and move above that um, into the helicopter lens. They sometimes use bargaining with the person and their networks as a strategy. And one of the um, participants said that they might use a worst case scenario to move a person's um, will and preference towards the option that they feel is least risky. Um, they also might use the authority of others to influence the person. And this really came out around health decisions, um, which were complex and had substantial con consequences. And it seemed as though in some of these situations, guardians use the authority and the knowledge of the professionals to influence a person. So move towards more a medical model sometimes, um, which was really interesting. They also, Guardian suggested that they were more worried about informal decisions of networks where they had not been told about them, but they were quite happy for informal decisions to be made when they did know that a, a network was making them and what the consequences um, were of those decisions. So really in summary, um, I've outlined for you very quickly navigating the theme of navigating the authorizing environment um, and more substantially using a helicopter lens. Um, yet to come is mobilizing, maneuvering and relying on networks. And that's a really interesting theme as well because guardians do this in a seamless way and um, using a lot of techniques which actually interlink into the other themes as well. Coming back to the aims, um, I was able with these themes to, to dig down and find out how guardians did practically make decisions day to day on the ground and found that um, they were very person-centered and they were very oriented towards a person's will and preference. Um, although the conservative environment that they were working in around risk did hamper this. And their practices were really inclusive of the person themselves. Um, in fact, that was a real theme that came through. And if you look back at this um, summary of themes, making empowerment fundamental um, reflects that. Also, um, what I would like to find out in looking at the data and analyzing it further is whether the process aligns with supported decision-making principles. And that's really about whether it aligns with the um, human rights approach of the UNCRPD, but goes a little further in asking the question. Um, so when guardians are making these practical decisions for people with disability, are they taking them along on the journey themselves? And how are they then um, using substitute judgment to support decision-making and are they doing it? And is it the same thing? So it's quite a complicated um, aim, but I'm hoping to get to that next. So any questions? Um, happy to be contacted on these numbers and by email.